I'd like to say a very big welcome to this talk on Frances Hodgson Burnett and her classic novel, The Secret Garden. So I'd like to begin with a reading from the novel, which I hope will take you back down memory lane. Mary Lennox had heard a great deal about magic in her Ayers stories, and she all, always said that what happened almost at that moment was magic. One of the nice little gusts of wind rushed down the walk, and it was a stronger one than the rest. It was strong enough to wave the branches of the trees, and it was more than strong enough to sway the trailing sprays of untrimmed ivy hanging from the wall. Mary had stepped close to the robin, and suddenly the gust of wind swung aside some loose ivy trails, and more suddenly still she jumped toward it and caught it in her hand. This she did because she had seen something under it, a round knob which had been covered by the leaves hanging over it. It was the knob of a door. She put her hands under the leaves and began to pull and push them aside. Thick as the ivy hung, it nearly all was a loose and swinging curtain, though some had crept over wood and iron. Mary's heart began to thump and her hands to shake a little in her delight and excitement. The robin kept singing and twittering away and tilting his head on one side as if he were excited as she was. What was this under her hand, which was square and made of iron and which her fingers found a hole in? It was the lock of the door, which had been closed ten years and she put her hand in the pocket, drew out the key, and found it fitted the keyhole. She put the key in and turned it. It took two hands to do it, but it did turn. And then she took a long breath and looked behind her up the long walk to see if anyone was coming. No one was coming. No one ever did come, it seemed. And she took another long breath because she could not help it and she held back the swinging curtain of ivy and pushed back the door, which opened slowly, slowly. Then she slipped through it and shut it behind her and stood with her back against it, looking about her and breathing quite fast with excitement and wonder and delight. She was standing inside the secret garden. It was the sweetest, most mysterious looking place anyone could imagine. The high walls which shut it in were covered with the leafless stems of climbing roses, which were so thick that they were matted together. Mary Lennox knew they were roses because she had seen a great many roses in India. All the ground was covered with grass of a wintry brown, and out of it grew clumps of bushes, which were surely rose bushes, if they were alive. How still it is! She whispered, how still. Then she waited a moment and listened to the stillness. The robin who had flown to his treetop was still as all the rest. He did not even flutter his wings. He sat without stirring and looked at Mary. No wonder it is still, she whispered again. I am the first person who has spoken in here for ten years. She moved away from the door stepping as softly as if she were afraid of awakening someone. She was glad that there was grass under her feet and that her steps made no sounds. She walked under one of the fairy-like grey arches between the trees and looked up at the sprays and tendrils which formed them. I wonder if they are all quite dead, she said. Is it all a quite dead garden? I wish it wasn't. If she had been Ben Weatherstaff, she could have told whether the wood was alive by looking at it, but she could only see that there were only grey or brown sprays and branches, and none showed any sign of even a tiny leaf bud anywhere. But she was inside the wonderful garden, and she could come through the door under the ivy any time, and she felt as if she had found a world all of her own. So that's Mary's lovely entry into The Secret Garden. Now, Little Lord Fauntleroy and The Secret Garden are children's classics. 
They were written 25 years apart, and the author was considered, along with Henry James, as one of the leading writers in the United States because of the books that she wrote for adults. One critic even compared her with George Eliot, which seems extraordinary to us today. This is the president of the United States, President Garfield. He absolutely adored the novels of Frances Hodgson Burnett. She was admired by Gladstone, by President Garfield, by Henry James. She was an amazing traveler who crossed the Atlantic 33 times. She was involved in a lawsuit which she won, which helped change English copyright law. He also survived two broken marriages and the death of a son. And I think Frances Hodgson Burnett's favorite theme was the idea of a reversal of fortune, a sort of rags to riches or riches to rags story. And that is something that appears very frequently in her fiction. Now she was born in the industrial city of Manchester on the 24th of November, 1849. Engels, who was living in the city at that time, wrote of the horrific conditions in this Victorian industrial city. He wrote of how a multitude of covered passages led from the main streets into numerous courts, and he who turns thither gets into a filth and a disgusting grime, the equal of, equal of which is not to be found. And this illustration gives some idea of the chimneys and the factories of industrial Manchester. And the slums there were truly terrible. Now, the Hodgson family, she was born Frances Hodgson, lived right on the edge of the slums. And I think she grew up very aware that if you just slipped a little way and lost money, you would end up in these terrible slums too. Her father worked as an ironmonger and a silversmith. And they had come down in the world from what they had been used to. And even in her poorest moments, when she was very hungry, Mrs. Hodgson would refuse to sell the little bits of nice linen and silver that meant her, she was still genteel. She really clung to that sense of gentility. And uh, this mother placed on her daughter Frances a great stress on this idea of good manners and gentility. Now, young Frances was a strongly imaginative child, and she loved making up stories. In 1853, so she was just a, a little girl of four, uh, her father ended up dying from apoplexy. And Mrs. Hodgson gave birth to another baby just a few months after her husband died. She had five children to care for and a little business to keep running. So various relatives helped, but it was a very precarious childhood when it came to family finances. And young Frances really escaped into books. In fact, she later said that her life was a life founded and formed upon books. A very important book for her when she was a child was one called The Little Flower Book. And this seems to have had a great influence on her writing of The Secret Garden. Here's another picture of a slightly more respectable side of Manchester. Now, she had dolls as a child, and she loved making up doll uh, stories about her dolls, as Sarah Crewe does in the novel The Little Princess. She has her doll, Emily, and she tells Emily's stories. She went to a school run by two clergymen's daughters. Now, at that time in Manchester, a third of the children of the city had no education whatsoever. So Frances was lucky that she got a good education at the school she attended. But her family moved often, and she was always aware of the barefoot, hungry children working in the factories nearby. Uh, and in one street, very close to where she lived, there was one privy for 380 inhabitants. This, in fact, is the Manchester described so vividly by Elizabeth Gaskell in her novels Mary Barton on North and South. Frances loved the way the slum children spoke. Her mother was always telling her to talk genteel, but she actually was fascinated by the dialect used by the slum children, and that would come through in some of her later novels. She was evidently a very good mimic when it came to accents. And at school, she was so good at telling stories that her schoolmates just kept begging her for stories, and she would keep a whole story going for weeks and weeks as she entertained all of her school friends. 
He was also at this early stage writing poetry. But things were very hard for her mother coping with five children. And there were at this time a lot of bankruptcies in Manchester. Finally, she decided to sell the business and move off to the States where one of her brothers had gone to live in Tennessee. He was running a little store there. So Mrs. Hodgson thought, right, we've, we've got a better chance of things uh, looking up for us in America. In 1865, the family sailed from Liverpool with young Frances very excited indeed about the mood. She was 15, she was romantic, she was curious about the big world out there. So they ended up in the States, but when they got there, they found that the uncle's business was actually doing very badly just at the end of the Civil War. Homes had been burned, fields were barren. They lived in a little log cabin, as you can see from the sign. The cabin, of course, is no longer there, but things were very difficult indeed when they first arrived in America. Now, there was a nearby family called Dr. Burnett and his uh, wife and children. And one of those children was a man called Swan Burnett, a very unusual name for a boy. This would be Francis's future husband. So the family tried to earn money by giving music lessons, doing sewing, uh, having chickens and selling the eggs, running a school, whatever they could find that would bring in a little bit of money. And Frances, of course, was keen to make money from her writing. Now, Godey's Ladies Book was a hugely popular publication in America at this time. It was, in fact, the favorite ladies' magazine of the day. But Godey's in America had, there was at that time, no international copyright laws. So Godey's could publish anything published in England and not have to pay one single cent in royalties to the author back in England. And many authors of the day got very upset about this. Dickens had challenged it and said, this has got to change. Uh, and uh, Francis would bring about a lot of change to this lack of decent copyright laws. She became very keen to send a story to Bodie's Ladies Book, but she was very worried about whether she needed to pay for the return postage in case her story was rejected. So she and her sister Edwina uh, ended up picking wild grapes and selling them to get enough money to pay for the postage to send off the story to Godey's Lazy Ladies Book. And the story was called Miss Carruthers' Engagement. But Godey's replied that the story was too long, but they would be interested in seeing something shorter from her. So she sent a story called Hearts and Diamonds, and she was paid the grand sum of $15 for the story. And it appeared in June. 1868. She was 18 years old and this would be the start of getting published for her. There was no stopping her from this time. Now this is Swan Burnett, the man that she ended up marrying. Frances's mother died in 1870 at the young age of 55. Swan was extremely keen on Francis but she made him wait for seven years before she agreed to marry him. She never called him Swan. She thought it was a very stupid name for a man. She had a great number of other names for him, but she always avoided his actual name. Now, soon she was getting her stories published in many of the major American magazines of the day. In all her work, she reveals a weakness for great physical beauty. So many of her characters are beautiful, although of course Mary in The Secret Garden is not. And she loved romantic names like Daisy Dalrymple or Polly Pemberton. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, she loved the idea of a reversal of fortune. I think she was poor at this time. She was dreaming of making money through the writing of her novels. Now, there was a man at Scribner's magazine called Mr. R. W. Gilder. And you can see him in the oval picture here. And he would prove to be an excellent advisor to Frances when it came to her writing. He encouraged her, he published a lot of her works. And uh, thanks to the money that was now starting to come in, she was able to plan a visit to England in 1872. When finally she came back to Tennessee, she got married to Swan Burnett in September 1873. And the couple honeymooned in New York. Soon she was pregnant. She ended up having two sons, Lionel and Vivian. But the uh, marriage was not always an easy one. 
Swan took over having the dealings with the publisher as sort of was expected for a man in that era. But he does seem to have rather resented the fact that his wife was the major breadwinner, was the major earner of the family. And of course, that was certainly not a usual situation in America at that time. There you can see Frances with her two sons. Now, that trip to England and revisiting Manchester had stirred her memories of the British slums, and she began a book set in that city called That Lass of Lowry's. Her husband wanted, uh, he was a doctor like his father, he wanted to have specialist eye-ear training in Europe, so they moved to France for a while, and she supported them while he did his training, uh, and of course she had to look after the children as well, uh, it was in France that she actually gave birth to the second of her sons. They were short of money. It was, again, a difficult time. So Frances was very, very aware of needing to make money from her writing. So she then published the book, That Lesser Lowry's, and it began to be serialized by Scribner's magazine. So she made money from the serialization, and then she made money when the book was produced in a one-volume novel. Uh, so back in the States, uh, she, uh, her husband set his, himself up in a medical practice in Washington, but he was slow to get patients. And so it was the money that came in from her writing that supported the family. Now, this book was a phenomenal success. A third edition came out within three weeks of the first edition. I suspect that none of you out there have read that Lass of Lowry's. I have not even seen a copy of the book but it was an amazing bestseller in its day. It dealt with the squalor of the Manchester slums, and Americans of the day seemed to have loved their squalor at a distance. There was plenty of, of poverty in the New York slums. They didn't want to read about that. They didn't want to read about racial poverty and things like that in America. Uh, stories dealing with the New York slums didn't sell nearly as well, but they loved reading about the slums over in England. So from this time, her earlier stories were all reissued, and really everything she wrote from this time sold extremely well. She really just couldn't write fast enough for her publishers. This is another novel of hers, 1879. It sold uh, 10,000 copies in its first few weeks alone, and it also sold very well in the UK. Some of her works were being adapted for the stage, and because there were no proper copyright laws, Anybody could just suddenly adapt her, her novel into a play and she wasn't paid anything for, for, the, uh, for the story. So she began to get in quickly and write dramatizations of her own works before anybody else could do, do so. She was starting to travel more. She was beginning to mix with the, the rich and the famous because she had made such a name for herself through her novels. But she had to work so hard to bring in the money that she described herself as being a pin driving machine. So I think she did suffer from exhaustion at churning out these novels at such a rate. Uh, in 1882, a young Irishman called Oscar Wilde came to America and he had a phenomenally successful lecture tour. And one of the things that he became famous for, or notorious for, depending on your point of view, was wearing knee breeches and velvet jackets and having his hair a little on the long side, silk stockings and things like that. And it's thought that uh, seeing Oscar Wilde and Frances met him were uh, greatly influenced her depiction of little Lord Fauntleroy, who of course dresses in velvets and ruffs and silk stockings and things like that. Uh, her next book was one called In Connection with De Willoughby Claim, again a book that I haven't read and I suspect most of you have not, but it was phenomenally popular. Once again, uh, Francis was very interested in politics. President Garfield and his wife became quite good friends, uh, so a few of her next books dealt with the uh, United States political uh, situation. What a lot of interesting things she could have written about the current American political situation. Uh, another book called Through One Administration was also a political novel. And because her own marriage was not a very happy one, she tends in her fiction to avoid romantic relationships. And we certainly see that in The Secret Garden. The children are too young to be thinking of romance. But it's something that she did try to avoid. 
Now, everything that she wrote was selling incredibly well, and most critics were praising her. But she started to feel a little guilty that she was not spending more time with her young sons. So she decided to write something especially for them. But this time they were seven and five, and they were happy children, and they called her dearest. So a lot of her own sons went into little Lord Fauntleroy. Uh, she did have a real weakness, as I said, for picturesque clothing, velvet and silk stockings. And velvet was, at the time, quite popular for suits for little boys. By this time, she was in her 30s and was considered one of the most popular novelists in the United States. She hated being photographed, and she said there was never a flattering portrait of her. But uh, she, she got on with writing Little Lord Fauntleroy. And sadly for her son, he would always be identified, her son Vivian, as the sort of model for Little Lord Fauntleroy. And I think he came to really hate the novel. Now, it became phenomenally popular in England and in America. Of course, it's about a little American boy who suddenly finds that he's uh, in line to inherit an English earldom. And the Americans loved it because Cedric, the little hero, was so democratic and upheld all the American principles, and yet it satisfied their love of the English aristocracy, that this young American was going to become an English earl, and he teaches that old English earl a lot of very good lessons. So it became uh, an absolute bestseller, and uh, it's a good story. I've, I've always greatly enjoyed Little Lord Fauntleroy. I think it's, it's well worth reading, a little perhaps sentimental for today's readers' tastes, but it, it, it caused what was described at the time as a public delirium of joy. And people bought things that were connected with the novel, and many a mother tried to dress her son just like little Lord Fauntleroy. So there you can see a little boy dressed in little Lord Fauntleroy style. There were little Lord Fauntleroy playing cards and all sorts of merchandise connected with this novel. Gladstone, the English Prime Minister, adored the book. So it was published as a book in October 1886. And one year later, 43,000 copies of the novel had been sold, which was a huge number for that time. In fact, the book became one of the biggest sellers of all time. The only other book that was in more American libraries than Little Lord Fauntleroy was Ben-Hur. And as you can see from this, it was translated into many different languages. So it became phenomenally popular. And there you can see William Gladstone, one of the great admirers of the novel. Gladstone was a wonderful reader had a fantastic library. So uh, whether you share his politics or not, I've always had a soft spot for Gladstone because of his very passionate love of novels. Now her next book was one called Sarah Crewe, published in 1888. This was sort of a, an early version of her novel, The Little Princess. She and her boys sailed to Britain for the 50th Jubilee year, uh, and they wintered in Europe. She actually met Gladstone on that visit. And he commented to her that he believed the book would have a great effect in bringing about good feeling between the two nations. Then suddenly she heard that a man in England had made a dramatic version of Little Lord Fauntleroy. She was furious and felt it really was time that copyright laws were changed because she was making no money from this theatrical version. So in 1888, there was a very big court case where she fought this man. And the man had to give up his play and pay all the costs of the court case. And from this time, copyright would really change for authors. And Frances wrote her own version of the play. And for many years, in the theatrical versions, the little boy, Cedric, would be played by female actors. So uh, the Society of Authors was so delighted by what Frances had done for copy changing copyright laws that they put on an enormous dinner to celebrate all of this. Frances was the main guest. She was presented with a beautiful diamond bracelet by the Society of Authors. And the card that went with it was signed by 84 English writers, including Tennyson, Henry James, Ryder Haggard, George Meredith, and the Irish writer Oscar Wilde. So after all of this excitement, she went back to the United States. And as you can see from these two pictures, she was very fond of clothes and 
when she had to have the hated photographs taken, she made sure that she dressed very well for them. Here you can see her young son Vivian dressed a la little Lord Fauntleroy. The Fauntleroy clothes were now the fashion all over Britain and the United States. In the state of Iowa, an eight-year-old boy burned down his father's barn in protest at being made to wear such clothes. It really did become a mania. One boy who really struggled with it was a young boy called Alan Alexander Milne. We know him as A.A. A. Milne. His mother had read Little Lord Fauntleroy. She was determined to dress him in the style. She wouldn't let him have his hair cut till he was about, I think it was eight or nine years old. And Milne would later look back and say that the day he had his hair cut short was the happiest day of his entire life. So he came to loathe the novel Little Lord Fauntleroy. Now, during these next years, Frances was constantly backwards and forwards between England and the United States. She continued to churn out novels and stories, and here is one of hers serialized in Scribner's magazine, The Pretty Sister of Jose. Uh, the Fortunes of Philippa Fairfax, The Captain's Youngest, Edith's Burglar, and many of these stories were also turned into plays, so she made more money from them when they were dramatized. Now, in England, she had met a man called Stephen Townsend. He had trained as a doctor, but he really wanted to be an actor. She would end up doing an enormous amount to help him. He became for a while her secretary, then he became her doctor, and finally, he became her second husband. Now, Francis in the year 1888 was thrown from a horse and was uh, very ill for some months after that accident, and she seems to have sunk into a depression. In 1890, her son Lionel fell ill during a very bad flu epidemic, and it turned out that he had tuberculosis. She returned to uh, the, the United States to get him. She took him to Europe. She nursed him very devotedly through his illness, and he died in Paris in 1890. She collapsed as a result of her terrible grief over losing her son. And from this time, she did a lot of work for charities for young boys. And there we can see a couple more pictures of Frances. It took a long time before she could write another good book after losing her son. Now she became very interested in the Regency period, a period in which I have a great deal of interest because my favorite novelist Jane Austen lived in that time. But she would end up writing quite a few books set in the time of the Regency. Uh, there was a play called The First Gentleman of Europe, there was a novel called A Lady of Quality. She also turned that into a play and another book called His Grace of Osmond. And all of these books were selling incredibly well. But do you ever see any of these books today in secondhand bookshops or libraries? Apart from her three main classics, you just do not see any of her other works. In London, she mixed in literary circles. She knew people like Aubrey Beardsley, George Moore, Edmund Goss, the de Maurier family, Mrs. Humphrey Ward, another very popular novelist of the day. And she and her husband, Stephen, collaborated on turning this particular novel, A Lady of Quality, into a play. Now, she was seeing quite a lot of her sister, Edith, and we can see Edith in the picture here. And Edith was a little short of money, and Frances would sort of play fairy godmother, giving money to Edith and her children. And she helped many of her relatives and friends. In 1898, she and her husband Stephen were divorced, and divorce was far from normal at that time. This is the home that she had in London. It's in Portland Place, and you can see one of the famous London blue plaques on the wall there. But she was getting a little sick of living in London, and she ended up buying a country property. So you get a sense of how much money she was making from her novels when you think that this was what she was able to afford from writing them. I wish I could earn the sort of money from writing that would buy me a house like Maitham Hall, a truly gorgeous home. And this would be the house, or more particularly its garden, that would inspire her most famous novel. She loved the idea of being Lady of the Manor, and uh, she was much loved by the local people to whom she was extremely generous. Now, Great Maytham Hall had a walled garden, and it would be this garden that would inspire her novel. 
But first she worked on a very long novel called The Shuttle, which uh, also sold fairly well. She turned her novel Sarah Crewe into another novel, The Little Princess, my own personal favourite of her books. Uh, and she also turned it into a play. And it came out as a novel in 1904. It's thought that some of the secret garden was written in this little writing hut or garden hut at Great Maven Hall. I love the novel, The Little Princess. That was the one of hers that I reread most frequently as a child. It's a riches to rags and back to riches story. And again, it was phenomenally popular when it came out as a novel in the year 1904. Now, Henry James lived quite near to where Francis was living in Great Maven Hall. Uh, he adored Francis. He called her noblest of neighbors and most heavenly of women. Quite a compliment coming from Henry James. And there you can see her uh, in, at that time in her life. So she suddenly decided that she was, uh, sorry, she, she got divorced from her husband, Swan, uh, and in February 1900, she married her doctor, Stephen Townsend. She was 50 and he was 40. He was hypersensitive, temperamental. Uh, it was, a, I think, a doomed marriage from the very beginning. She was now quite stout. She had um, dyed her hair, another quite unusual thing for women at that time, and she loved putting on lots of rouge. Uh, it's thought by some biographers that uh, her husband Stephen actually blackmailed her into marrying. Uh, he didn't love her, he just wanted her money. They had evidently a completely ghastly honeymoon. Her son Vivian refused even to speak to Stephen, and the marriage was miserable from the very beginning. But through it all, she kept writing. And here are some of her other novels. Um, I suspect that most of you have not heard of any of them. Uh, the Making of a Marchioness is considered one of her better books from this time. Uh, but the novel about the De Willoughby claim had by this time sold over 100,000 copies. So it was a real bestseller for its day. Now, she decided she just couldn't keep living with Stephen. She sold Great Maven Hall. She wanted to try and keep her earnings from her now uh, about to be ex-husband. So she decided to take out American citizenship in 1905 and move back to America. And um, uh, her ex-husband, actually the, the first husband, died in 1906. He had remarried after Francis left him. So in America, she purchased a house called uh, Fair Seat at a place called Plandome on Long Island. The house is no longer there. This is an old photograph of it. And you get a sense that she was still so keen on gardens that it does have a rather lovely garden. So she built the house. It was sort of Italianate in style. It had beautiful views and, as you can see, the garden. So, but she still kept crossing between England and America 33 times she made that crossing at a time when people were not such big travelers as they are what well, used to be uh, before the Shia. Uh, so she was she really felt that she belonged to both countries. She wrote a book called The Dawn of a Tomorrow. Uh, that too was an enormous success and once again she turned it into a play. And she started to plan a really lovely garden at her American home. And she was one of those gardeners who actually got down herself and pulled out weeds. She didn't just direct a team of, of men working in her garden. So there's interest in her garden. The memory of the garden, the walled garden at Great Maytham Hall, would result in the novel that, which I think she is best remembered today. Although during her lifetime, it was certainly not her most loved novel. The Secret Garden came out in 1911 and it charmed everybody. Frances had been reading Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte for the first time. And I think you can see echoes of Jane Eyre in this book. It's also set in Yorkshire. There are strange cries from an upper story during the night. There is a rather plain heroine. Uh, you can see many things that were influenced by her reading of Jane Eyre. And I think like Charlotte Bronte, she did something quite uh, unusual in choosing a disagreeable heroine and also a hypochondriac boy. We hear in the novel 
When Mary Lennox was sent to Misselthwaite Manor to live with her uncle, everybody said she was the most disagreeable looking child ever seen. But what's so wonderful about the novel is that the garden brings about a transformation in the lives of two very unhappy, and perhaps today we would say abused, children. She shows excellent psychology in the novel, and she shows that children can be self-reliant, and they can bring about improvements in their own lives, particularly if they work at something. And I think a lot of the message of this novel is the importance of work. The novel was full of good gardening detail. It's been said that you can learn about pruning roses just from reading this novel. And Frances loved detail. She always said it was uh, not enough to mention that characters sit down and have tea. She said, you must specify the muffin. So you've got to say what's eaten for tea. You can't just say they sat down and had a nice tea. The next book was one called Tea Pemberon, which is a sort of adult version of Little Lord Fauntleroy. I think she loved children and she could really relate to them on their own level. And this comes through in The Secret Garden. She began traveling to Bermuda in order to escape the cold winter months on Long Island. And uh, she started to fall in love with the cinema and some of her novels became quite early movies. Uh, the Dawn of a Tomorrow, Esmeralda, The Little Princess, Little Lord Fauntleroy, with Mary Pickford playing Cedric Errol, uh, and his mother, interestingly enough, uh, and The Pretty Sister of Jose were all novels that were filmed, uh, and she got to see the movie versions. In 1914, her husband Stephen died at the age of 54. And there you can see Mary Pickford uh, in the version of Little Lord Fauntleroy. This was uh, the one on the left was Frances's favourite photograph of herself. And I think it is a very nice photograph. Her son became engaged, got married and gave her two granddaughters. She was a very devoted grandma. She really adored her grandchildren. Uh, she wrote a book called The Lost Prince. She continued to turn books into plays. Uh, so her pen machine was still going strong. And she was getting fan letters from a huge number of people. There was even a woman called Helen Keller who wrote her a fan letter saying how much she had loved Frances's novels. But then she had to cope with a really horrible court case and she found all of this incredibly stressful. Her sister Edith had a son called Archie who had got married and Francis gave Archie and his wife a house on the understanding uh, and a lot of financial help as well uh, that they would have Archie's mother, uh, her, her sister, uh, to live with them there. Now the married couple decided not to invite his mother to come and live with them uh, they, and you know uh, Frances was very angry about this. She said that's why I gave you the house. You've got to have my sister Edith there to live with them, live with you. And various letters were written and uh, uh, Frances made some accusations. She uh, accused Archie's wife Annie of making mischief and said she was a liar, slanderer and an ill-bred meddler and a shrew and a doubtful character, subject to brainstorms. So all of this ended up in the courtroom. And this private letter was published and there was an enormous court case in 1917. But the judge ruled that it was a private correspondence and that therefore could not damage the plaintiff, Annie, because it had not appeared in the public arena. There was an appeal and Paul Francis had to go through the whole thing over again, but the original decision was upheld. But this all rather shattered her image of herself as sort of a kind fairy godmother. There you can see her with her secretary called Louisa, and she needed a secretary because those novels were still appearing. The Head of the House of Coon and Robin were some of her later novels. But I think reading tastes were now changing. Her contemporaries were now reading people like Virginia Woolf, very different indeed from Frances Hodgson Burnett. In 1919, she celebrated her 70th birthday and her health was by this time very bad. She wrote, I do want to be let alone by pain. Her son Vivian took care of her business affairs and she was worth a huge amount of money. 
She spent her summers at her house on Long Island and her winters in New York hotels, so she was living very comfortably indeed. Her very last work was one called In the Garden, and this would be her last public appearance when the book came out, uh, and then she, she turned out uh, at the time of the book's publication for the Mary Pickford film of Little Lord Fauntleroy. In 1939, uh, the actress Shirley Temple acted as the little princess, as uh, the part of Sarah Crewe. But the novel had enormous changes from the original. Queen Victoria puts in an appearance in it, uh, and it was a, a very distorted version of the novel. Personally, I'm not fond of Shirley Temple. I haven't watched the version, and I don't intend to. Now, Francis died on the 29th of October, 1840. Sorry. Uh, 19, 1924, at Plandome, uh, her Long Island home, at the age of 74. She was buried on Long Island. On the centenary of her birth, Life magazine had an enormous article about Little Lord Fauntleroy and the phenomenal influence this novel had had around the world. There is also a memorial to her in Central Park in New York with statues of a boy and a girl in a garden, so this commemorates the secret garden. Her son Vivian wrote a memoir. Uh, he ended up dying while trying to rescue somebody in a boating accident. So Frances Hodgson Burnett had written 13 plays and about 50 novels and volumes of short stories. She wrote towards the end of her life, I have tried to write more happiness into the world, and I think she succeeded in that aim. So let's have a closer look at The Secret Garden, such a lovely novel. Many, many different editions, as you can see here from just a very small fraction of the different editions of the novel. It came out uh, in uh, book form after it had been serialized in an American magazine. So in installments first and then in book form. Young Mary, the heroine of the novel, is 10 years old neglected and unloved. She has grown up in India with parents who have no interest in her whatsoever. She's spoiled, very self-centered, and she's been used to being cared for by very devoted Indian servants. So when her parents die in a cholera epidemic, she is sent to live with a relative in England in a rather gloomy Yorkshire house called Mistlethwaite Manor. She hears from the servant Martha about her aunt Lilius, who loved the garden that was on the estate. She grew roses there. But then her aunt died from an accident, and so the garden was closed up, and people don't go into it. And during the night, Mary hears strange cries from somewhere else in the house. So as I mentioned earlier, it was a brave novel in having a heroine who is extremely unlikable at the beginning of the story. She's nasty, she's spoiled, she's rude to people, but of course, we can see from the psychology of, of what's gone on in Mary's past, where she's coming from and why she is like the way she is. But it is the garden in the novel that brings about Mary's regeneration. Children in this book learn that by working at something, by nurturing what you care about, that will bring its own reward. And if you tend something, then it brings you satisfaction and beauty and delight in the end. So I think this is a novel that's all about healing. And here we see Mary sitting with Dickon, uh, who becomes her friend. He, of course, is the brother of Martha, who works at Misselthwaite Manor. So he's a servant boy. Again, she's showing a, a slightly more upper-class young girl becoming friendly with servants, something, again, quite, uh, quite radical for that time. And she shows how the garden brings about the friendships of the children and it begins the healing process from the damage that has been inflicted on them due to their very uh, strange and unhappy childhoods. Now, when the book was first published, it was not as popular as her other novels. It didn't sell anywhere near as many copies as Little Lord Fauntleroy or The, the Willoughby Claim or some of those other novels that were uh, her huge bestsellers. When the obituary appeared about Frances Hodgson, Hodgson Burnett's life, the Secret Garden was not even mentioned in that obituary. 
However, since her death, it has climbed steadily in its popular appeal. And in 2012, it was ranked number 15 among all time favorite children's novels. So that's a very high ranking indeed. The BBC's poll called The Big Read ranked the book as number 51. And that's not just children's novels, that is most beloved novels of all time. Uh, there's Misselthwaite Manor looking suitably gloomy and overgrown. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the sort of Bronte echoes are there throughout the book. Uh, Mary is unloved and unwanted here in this house until finally she becomes friendly with Martha and Dickon, and then she meets her cousin Colin, who of course lives up there somewhere on a top story and is an invalid. Uh, so the garden brings about his physical restoration as well as a psychological one. Now, over the years, there have been many interesting film versions of The Secret Garden. And as you can see from this picture, it has been translated into many, many other languages and it has been much loved around the world. The very first film version was a black and white film version made in the United States in the year 1919. The film is lost. All we have is a couple of pictures from it, uh, giving us a, a very faint idea of what it might have looked like. It would be fascinating to see that film. Then in 1949, there was an MGM, uh, again, an American version with Margaret O'Brien as Mary, Dean Stock. Stockwell as Colin and Brian Roper as Dickon. So uh, that was a popular version and was a little bit more faithful to the novel. But uh, then uh, uh, that, that was, sorry, that version was filmed in black and white, but the scenes in the garden at the end when the garden has been restored were filmed in Technicolor. So it switched from being black and white for the more unhappy parts of the story and full Technicolor uh, for the more restored and happier scenes in the novel. Noel Streetfield's 1948 novel called The Painted Garden actually deals with the making of this film. In 1993, there was another American production with Kate Maberly as Mary, Hayden Prowse as Colin, and Andrew Knott as Dickon. And Maggie Smith has a role in that film version as Mrs. Medlock, the housekeeper. Of course, Maggie Smith is always fabulous. And then we get the very recent film, and I don't know how many of you out there have been to see The Secret Garden, uh, but uh, it had Colin Firth as the uh, uh, Colin's father, and he's hunchbacked, uh, and a lot of changes were made to the plot. I have to say I was actually really disappointed in this film version. I found it a bit dull. I found myself actually looking at my watch, thinking, you know, how much longer is this going to last? Uh, I really disapproved of the many changes that were made to the plot. Misselthwaite Manor catches on fire at the end and Mary's involved in saving Uncle Archibald from the flames. Uh, Julie Christie was good as Mrs. Medlock, uh, but there were just so many changes. And I was really disappointed. Pippi Edgerix uh, plays uh, Mary. Eden Hayhurst plays Colin. Amir Wilson uh, play, he's an actor from Jamaica, plays Dickon, so it was an example of the current fad for colorblind casting, uh, and Julie Walter and Colin Firth were the two adults. Now, The Garden was criticized in this film version for being something out of Jurassic Park rather than an English stately home garden. Uh, it was, there was a bit of sort of magical realism. You saw the plants growing at an amazing rate, they changed the uh, time setting of the novel. It was made later, so Mary's parents are killed off in an Indian mutiny, and they changed the ending as well. But what really upset me in this film version is that the children do not do one second of work in this garden. You never see them pulling a weed or using a shovel or uh, you know, doing anything at all to tend the plants in the garden. They just lounge around, they swim in the river that goes through it, uh, they climb trees, they talk, but they don't do any work. And for me, the entire message of this book is that the children are working in the garden and that the work is what teaches them the, uh, the lessons that the three children all need to learn. So I was really, really disappointed. But uh, 
Some reviewers gave it a, a good rating. Others said, uh, no, very disappointing indeed. Uh, perhaps it depended on whether those reviewers had read the book, but I just couldn't see the point of the many changes that were made. So there you can see Mary and Dickon, uh, they climb up this vine to get into the garden, but throughout the whole, all they're doing is sort of having fun and, and laughing and fooling around. As I say, no work happens. And while I can see the reasons behind colorblind casting, uh, had there been a young black servant or two black servants, because Martha is also black in this version, uh, living in Yorkshire as servants uh, in the Victorian era, I think it would have been commented on and would have been seen as something very unusual indeed. But no comments are made uh, and it's just taken for granted that Dickon is black and uh, there are, there's, you, you get nothing further about it. And, and to me that's a bit unrealistic and I think it undercuts the struggles that black people had in Victorian England to be recognised as equals. Now there have also been television versions of The Secret Garden. In 1952, an eight-part serial, and here you can see pictures from the 1975 seven-part serial uh, starring Sarah Hollis Andrews, and uh, that was a, a fairly faithful version of the novel. Then in 1987, uh, there was uh, a version starring Jenny James, and it had Derek Jacobi as Mr. Craven, and interestingly, Colin Firth acts the growing up Colin at the end of the film. So Colin Firth as an actor has been in two different versions of The Secret Garden. And this version was filmed at a place very familiar to people who enjoy television today, a place called High Clear, which we know better as Downton Abbey. Uh, a sequel was made to this film in the year 2001 called Back to the secret garden. So uh, it had done very well and they decided to capitalize on that success and create a sequel which brings in some romance to the story. And in 1994 there was an animated version of the secret garden so it has been enjoyed in its sort of more cartoon form by younger viewers and there's a Japanese anime version and that came out in 39 episodes. I think you could almost have watched in real time the plants growing in 39 episodes of The Secret Garden. I don't know how they managed to stretch it out over such a long time. I think Francis would approve of the fact that there have been also many different theatrical versions of this much beloved novel. So you're never too old to go back to a childhood favourite. When you pick up a book that you loved in childhood, you read it, of course, through adult eyes and, and I think often pick up on things that you missed completely as a child. You see it in a whole new way. Uh, so I do encourage you to go back to reread re this childhood favourite. Uh, and the handout that will be sent through to you after this talk lists some of the biographies that are available about Frances Hodgson Burnett. I think you will agree, an unusual and very interesting woman indeed. So whether you've seen the new movie version or not, or maybe seen some of those older versions that I have illustrated in my talk, films, of course, will come and go. It's the novel that is the great classic and that will last and I think continue to give delight to child readers and to adult readers around the world. I do hope that many of you will consider joining me for the next two uh, talks in this little mini series. This time next week, we'll be looking at that most haunting and wonderful novel, Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca. Last night I dreamt I was at Mandalay again. Such a vivid opening line. And uh, I don't know when Netflix is bringing out the new film version with Lily James, but it's from what I can see from the little uh, promo, it looks fabulous. Uh, so I look forward to telling you about a very strange, unusual woman, Daphne du Maurier, next week, and looking at another novel influenced by Jane Eyre, her wonderful book, Rebecca. The week after that, we have a little bit of mystery and murder in Egypt amongst pyramids and sphinxes uh, with uh, Death on the Nile, one of Agatha Christie's most famous and beloved novels. There have been several film versions of the book and Kenneth Branagh's new one is due out any day. 
uh, I did read somewhere October the 9th, which I think was yesterday. Uh, so hopefully it will be on at our cinemas very soon and some of us will be able to safely go to the cinema to get to see it. And uh, so in two weeks time, I look forward to telling you about the Queen of Crime, Agatha Christie, and one of her great classics. So thank you all so much for joining me this evening. I do hope you've had a glass of wine or something to refresh you as you sat and listened to this talk. I'd like to say a very big thanks to Cheryl Hill, who is my most wonderful assistant with all of this, uh, with the technology, which is way beyond me. So Cheryl, thank you so much for all of your help. And I'm now wondering if any questions are coming through, if anyone has anything they would like to ask. Susanna, no one's um, written any questions in the text. Okay. Nobody ever wants to ask the I first question. Look after all the bookings. <laughs> no questions for anybody? Oh, here we go. Margie wants to know who has copyright now? Uh, I think it would all be expired now. Um, copyright law keeps changing, and I think at the moment it's 75 years after the death of the author. Um, Although there are exceptions that can depend on also, it's a very, a, an absolute minefield, copyright law. Uh, it would have passed to her son, Vivian, so he would have lived very comfortably indeed on the works that his mother had written for the rest of his life. Uh, and uh, I'm assuming also the, the two granddaughters would have lived very comfortably. But uh, yes, and now it would, it would be expired. And so any publisher can bring out a copy of The Secret Garden and produce it with, with or without illustrations, do what they like to it. It can be sequeled, pre-called, adapted, uh, and no copyright has to be paid. Um, could, I, could I ask a question? Sure. Uh, Susanna, how do you explain the fact that nowadays no one really has ever heard of any of the other novels? Besides The Secret Garden and Little Lord Fontoy. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we have a fashion in novels as, as we have fashion in everything else. And, you know, they were so popular in their day, but you'd never see them now, apart from <laughs> Little Lord Fontenoy, The Little Princess and The Secret Garden. Uh, and you can't even say that it's films that have kept them going because there were film versions of some of those novels that are now so obscure today. Uh, I think... It's partly public taste. Uh, for many readers today, they're seen as a bit too sentimental. Perhaps the rags to riches is a little unbelievable for some readers. Um, sadly, children are not reading classics as much. So, but you know, I didn't get these books as a child, apart from the, the main three. Uh, so they would clearly gone out of fashion, you know, well before I was a child in the, in the 1960s. So it's, it's hard to say why some books last and, and others don't, but the hugely popular, important, regarded as important books, as I mentioned, she was compared to, to George Eliot. Uh, but even some of George Eliot's are sort of not much read today. So I think the author, uh, apart from a few really, really wonderful ones, has to cope with the idea that their best books will, will last and some of the others will just sort of sink away out of sight. Um, I did read her novel, Robin, uh, one of her later novels, and found it pretty dull, uh, so I could see why it had dropped from sight. Uh, but I do find the main three all worth rereading. I actually reread Little Lord Fauntleroy not long ago, and while I chuckled over some of the sentimental scenes and the sort of American democracy ideals that came through, uh, I did still really enjoy the story, and I found it moving. So, and I, I still go back to the little print of the secret garden with great pleasure. Thank you. Uh, we've had Kathleen would like to know which is your favorite, or do you have a favorite movie version of the secret garden? I think the Kate Maberly one, the, uh, what was the date? Um, the 1975 one, I think. And you can get that on DVD. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, not the most recent one, I'm sad to say, but maybe <laughs> some of you, I mean, when I wrote about it in my newsletter, um, somebody sent me quite an irate comment and said, I thought it was a wonderful movie. What are you going on about? Uh, but it's very personal. So, you know, I, I was disappointed and I couldn't see the point of changing the story. But obviously some people loved it. So 
you might have a very different response from me. <laughs> uh, we have another one here from Barry who says, fabulous talk, thank you. Um, he's interested to know why the little princess is your favorite. Can you explain that please? I think because my mother read it to me and she didn't read me The Secret Garden or Little Lord, Little Lord Fauntleroy, I read those on my own. Uh, my mother read to me a huge amount when I was a child and she gave me the copy as a birthday present and had beautiful illustrations in it with gorgeous clothes. And I loved looking at the pictures. And she read it to me and I just adored the story. And we talked about it together. And uh, I think that's probably why it's my favorite. I know I'm not in the majority there, but for most people, the favorite is Secret Garden. But uh, for me, it's the, it's the Little Princess. Uh, and there were Indian characters in it. Uh, Sarah, like Mary Lennox in The Secret Garden, had lived in India with her father. Uh, and as a, a very vicious school teacher, uh, I loved the exoticism of the, the Indian characters. Um, so I, it was just, and it was a wonderful depiction of, of child poverty in Victorian London. Uh, mm. Young Sarah is, is often hungry, but she when she has a, a couple of buns given to her, she gives them away to a child who's even hungrier than she is. Uh -huh. And I remember thinking that was so noble. I wasn't sure that I could give away any buns when I was starving. So it was a novel, I think, that left a deep impression on me. And I've loved it ever since. Thank you. Uh, just a, a message from Helen, who says, we visited the Lost Gardens of Heligan in Cornwall. I really felt I was in the secret garden. Oh, good. I've never been to the Lost Gardens of Heligan, and I would love to go there. Everyone says they're fabulous. So it's on my list when we can start traveling again. I hope to get there. Um, so thank you for sharing that. That will add to my uh, uh, anticipation of getting there one day. Okay, um, I don't have any other messages unless anyone else does. You could uh, perhaps unmute yourself if you'd like to ask Susanna something. No? no? Well, thank you all again for, for joining me for this mini-series. As I mentioned earlier, it was a little bit of an experiment. We had no idea how many bookings we would get for the talks and whether they would prove popular. Uh, I'm really thrilled that you have joined me and I do hope that you will join me for the next two weeks as well on Sunday uh, afternoons. And also, if you don't get my newsletter, do sign up for it, because that will keep you posted as to what talks I have coming up, uh, you know, what other things I'm doing in the way of tours when they start again. And uh, it's a free newsletter. It gives you reading recommendations, a lovely poem every month. I think there's a lot to enjoy in it. So do consider signing up for my newsletter if you do not already get it. Uh, and if you've, this is your first uh, talk, uh, experience of me giving a talk. Uh, I'm sorry it's by Zoom and not in person, but <laughs> welcome. And I do hope you'll come back for many more. So thanks everyone. I hope you've had a great weekend. I hope the week ahead will bring us decreasing figures when it comes to this dreaded uh, uh, virus that we're all suffering from. Uh, and uh, let's hope for good health in the future and of course, my favourite wish to give anyone, lots of good reading. Keep reading, stay well, and thank you, everyone. <laughs>